Uh, firstly, to say it's a great privilege to be here. I've never been to South Africa and Cape Town. It's an amazing place. And also to say hello to the people on the, the simulcasts who are watching around South Africa and in the room next door. Um, hello. This is Leonard Cohen. I really like Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen is a, is a poet and a songwriter. And he said, if I knew where ideas came from, I'd go there more often. And I've sort of dedicated my life to, um, to try, trying to find this place where the ideas are. And I use all sorts of techniques and methods to try and break through to this place. It exists in everybody's uh, subconscious, I believe, but um, there's just, you know, there's so many different ways you can do it. So I'm going to talk about some of my work and the different approaches, different methods I've used to try and find ideas, trying to get to this magical place. This is one of my studios in London. I live in London, and I've got everything I need, really. I've got, I can have a cup of tea and my pens and my sketchbook, and, and I just sit up there thinking of ideas. What I quite like about it is that it enables me to get away from it all, literally, because I think, you know, we're all on this sort of path of thinking the day-to-day -day things we think about, um, brushing our teeth, the shower, making a cup of coffee. Our brains are sort of on this path, but the ideas are way off it, and the further we can get off the path, the better. So one of the things I do is I try to get myself out of normality, in a way. So my story is, I, at school in Sunderland, which is in the northeast of England, I was third best at painting. Brendan Ferguson was, was the best, I can admit it now. Um, <laughs> and um, so I was third best, so I thought, okay, I'll do um, an art and design foundation course at Sunderland University. And on that course, there was a, there was a contemporary artist called Charlie Holmes. He was in the graphic section. And uh, he took us to, gal to contemporary art galleries and showed us books, and he set creative briefs. And I realized I could do, do these briefs, and I started coming up with sort of invention drawings based on everyday things. But I realized I really enjoyed doing it, and I realized that a desk job wasn't for me. So I'm just going to show some of the uh, inventions I've come up with. This is a dual-use coffin work desk, ideal for those who work hard all their lives and then die. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know you like wine here. Uh, bottle attachments to allow more sophisticated drinking out of the bottle. Um, very sophisticated people, I see. You, you enjoy that one. Um, this is wearable technology, name GPS. For those who forget names in social situations, you are facing Tom, turn left to face Claire. <laughs> so these ideas I'm coming up with in a, in a very cerebral way. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically looking at a blank sheet in a sketchbook and thinking, you know, thinking about life and, what, what, uh, and, and friends and, and things that have happened and, and objects and, and, and just like thinking it through, trying to get... Away. That's one way, I, I think. Here's another one, I think. Oh, yeah, this is a cost-saving five-plank fence. Sensor detects position of person and move fence accordingly. <laughs> now, this one is slides for falling leaves, because I think, you know, when the, slide, when the leaf is at the end of its life, it's got a final journey, why don't we just give it a send-off, give it some sort of entertainment? Um, <laughs> I do like to think of inanimate objects as people, as having a personality, and that helps me think in a way, about caring for things. <laughs> After that, I went to Edinburgh College of Art, and I, and I decided to make, make some of these invention drawings that I'd done. So I did a f I'm just showing a few here. This is a bed. So I think at the time I was thinking, well, you know, when you're asleep, you don't really need the rest of the mattress. Um, <laughs> my work is extremely logical, perfectly sensible. You know, I will defend it. Uh, this is a bird cage. <laughs> you open it up and put your bird in there. <laughs> and this, uh, this was at Edinburgh, and, I, and I, I went to the jewellery department, and I just asked, how can I make this bird cage? And, and, and I, that was my first uh, getting into making stuff. 
And, and actually what, I've, what, I've, what I worked out and what I know now is that making stuff um, is easier than you think. You know, you can be a bit frightened of making things. I lived in Japan for a year, taught English. I didn't really know where I fitted into anything. And, and then I came back and I went to the Royal College of Art on this design products course. Um, and I learned a new way of thinking, um, which was with your hands, you know, to actually start making prototypes or making, and you're making decisions all the time as you move things. You might make mistakes, things you're finding out through making. So that was different from pr the previous things where I'm just looking at a sketchbook or, 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 a, or a laptop or whatever. Um, it's thinking through making, which I think is probably one of, the, one of the best ways because you find surprises that you wouldn't have... You wouldn't have imagined in a sketchbook. You can't predict those things that happen. At the Royal College, one thing I did was a, a war bowl, bowls made of particular battles, historical battles. This is the Battle of Waterloo. It's half French, half British. This is the English Civil War. It's half parliamentarians, half uh, royalists. Basically, I, I thought, what would happen if I melted these soldiers? So I took them home, put them in the kitchen grill, melted them. When they cooled down, they came in into a solid sheet. I thought that was interesting, and it sort of developed from there. That's another way of thinking. Looking closer, I really believe, and I, I tell myself anyway, this to help me be creative and to, not, and to try to avoid sort of creative block. I tell myself that within everything that's around us, no matter how banal, no matter how everyday, these, this water, that microphone, there are hundreds of ideas waiting to be found. We've just got to look closer at them. And this is what I tell myself, that the ideas are there. They're all around us. This is a chair with a camera bag, but actually it's a sheep. I don't know whether you saw that. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, this is in my living room, and I, and I looked at the chair and I thought, that's a sheep. So there are ideas waiting to be found everywhere, in everything. This was a group show. And the challenge was, this was a group exhibition in East London in uh, Hoxton Square, a KK outlet. The challenge was to take an everyday object and turn it into another everyday object without adding anything to it. So you had to start with one and change it to something else. You could, add, uh, you could use glue and screws, but you couldn't join two different objects together to create a new thing. So sometimes when you get a brief like this, a creative challenge, it's quite difficult when things are really open and you can do anything in the world, all the everyday objects in the world. So anyway, uh, to focus the mind, I passed an art shop in London and I thought, right, right, I thought to myself, right, I'm going to find an object in here. I saw the brushes, there's some beautiful brushes, and I was standing in front of the brushes in the shop and I'm just going through my, in my head all the possible connotations and things I could do to brushes and the history of brushes and what I remember about brushes to try and find an idea. And the one thing I thought about was when you leave your, your paint brush uh, in the paint and then you wake up the next morning and it's hard. So I used that idea and I dipped these paint brush uh, bristles into a sort of resin glue, which then developed into these coat hook brushes. So all I needed to do was sand the back and there was already those holes. So, so yeah, that was one. This is another one. I've got a blog called variationsonnormal.com. And sometimes I just put up quick ideas that I have and I'll do them. So I've got my sketches there, but I'll also do some stuff really quickly and just put it online. And I was in the bath. That's the photograph of my phone on the floor in the bathroom. I got a text and I thought I should relax in the bath. You know, it's a time for relaxation, but I'm interested. So I reached, got the, got the text, but my hands were wet. If you've got wet hands, you can't use your, um, your screen. I don't know if you know that. Um, but you can use your nose. So, you know, you can scroll with your nose. Like, I can open this, so that, that works. But you can't see where you're going, really, because it's too close to you. So what I, th I thought, if I could extend it out a little bit, then I would be able to see where I'm going and use, and be in the bath, Everything, all the problems are solved. So I did this finger-nose stylus. Um, <laughs> I did a video quickly, just in the bath, setting up the tripod, getting in the bath, doing that. That went around the... It's still, go, it's still on television shows and whatever. I like to uh, have a conversation between me and my imagination and, and, and you, I guess, the, the viewer. And I'm sort of... Po I'm sort of... You know, in normal life, I... Um, I I'm from the northeast in England. We've got a very dry sense of humour, you know, uh, down to earth. 
Um, I'll say things that I think are mildly amusing, um, but, but I won't smile, I won't, you know, I won't give it away. You, I, I like letting the, the viewer do a little bit of work as to work out what's going on here. So I'm aware of the absurdity, but I also like making sort of social comment on our obsession with, um, with uh, gadgets, and this is sort of taking it to a, a, an end point. Time and improvisation, I actually forced myself to take some improvisation course last, last year when you're on the stage and you haven't improvised verbally, um, because I'm, I think improvisation is one of the mo most interesting forms of, of creativity. You actually go to the heart of creativity. It's a scary place to go, and most people avoid it. So I, I've done a few projects where I've put myself under time pressure, where I needed to be more instinctive and not be in my, stuck in my head, which I, I can be a lot. I'm a bit of a thinker. You know, I try to get out of that, so I'm just reacting. And um, there's just some projects that I did. This was in Milan, and I had a big room. I got given a big room, and I could do whatever I wanted, and it was over five days. So I invited the public to uh, bring in sticks of any top, uh, t type, chopsticks, brush, uh, toothbrush, um, these sort of sticks. So the public were bringing in these sticks, and I brought some tape uh, over from London to Milan. And my plan was to just sell a tape or tape the sticks to a chair that I would find in the gallery and just keep on going. And I didn't really know where it was going. I just thought, oh, it's interesting to do, and I'll just keep on going throughout the five days. So it sort of grew into this big um, thing. And it was, it was nice that the public were bringing more sticks, feeding this tree. Yeah, one of the things was like they had some spotlights, which I hadn't planned on using. Um, switch the spotlights on, and, and the spotlight projected a shadow across the floor. So I decided to use the red tape to trace the shadow on the floor, which created this sort of pattern. And, and I just like it how I wasn't, I was just reacting and being instinctive, and one thing leads to another. The importance of playfulness, I treat playfulness deadly seriously. I think it's the, the most important, uh, most powerful way of finding ideas. It doesn't matter if you think of yourself as sort of, sort of a serious designer, if you haven't started with a playful approach in the very beginning of creativity. I don't know, you're missing out, I think. Yeah, another thing, which this, this was another project which was playful and, and, and I was putting pressure on myself. I, d I did a project where I had to make uh, 30 things in 30 days. So one creative thing every day for 30 th days in a row and I would photograph it and video it and put it on my blog, Variations on Normal. And so I started this project. There was thousands of people following what I'm going to do the next day. These are just a couple of things. Uh, this was on, uh, on the second day, I had to go to Edinburgh, so I had to make something on the train. On day five, I thought, what, what would happen if you put uh, a light bulb in bread dough and put it in the oven? <laughs> well, this happens. It's a lovely glow and a lovely aroma when you switch the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> this was a pen. I was going to the pound shop. We have a like pound shop, so don't you probably have an equivalent here? Where I bought some coloured pencils, the box, and I cut it and made the bracket. That went online. That's on loads of craft blogs. Um, and my work sort of is in between art, design, craft, technology. I mean, I don't really like to say what it is. I just want to make interesting, in, uh, surprising, exciting ideas for my own excitement. I just want to excite myself, really. <laughs> but I also like communicating it. I'm a visual communicator. That's, I really enjoy that part. And this was balloon socks. So I put the balloon in the sock, I blew up the sock, then I dipped the sock in a resin and then made these lights. I was getting hungrier and hungrier because I had no time to eat. I was waking up at six o'clock in a cold sweat thinking, what am I going to do? All these people are expecting things. So I bought some onion rings and I stacked them up and I thought, could I stack them up to the top? But they kept falling down and I thought, oh, that's a nice pattern. That's interesting. I arranged them and I got some Yoohoo glue and I dotted between each of the onion rings and I left it for half an hour. Then I lifted it up and made this onion ring fabric. And then I put that online, and this got mentioned on Vogue Italian uh, website. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> 
I remember I was in a model shop looking for ideas and I thought, if you balanced something on the hands of a watch, would the watch hands still go round? And I, test, I bought this watch, cheap watch, and smashed it and put a little blob of clay on and it worked. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I could develop this further. So I didn't do it for the 30-day project, but it came out of this forced pressure improvisation project. And I showed it later. I developed it into this. Yeah, I sometimes think he's going to shake, but um, no, no, no. Yeah. And that was that was helped. I was helped by Dazine.com, which is uh, they also sell websites, and I I, I I I contacted them after I had that idea and they supported that. Making the most of what you've got. That's basically what I do. That's what I'm literally making the most of what I've got. I'm taking that to the end level. I want to start from nothing or just some little thing and make the most of it because I really think everything's got so much potential in it, even if you think it doesn't. So making the most of what I've got, is, it feels right as to what I'm doing. This is side signage rings to bring more attention to your engagement ring. <laughs> There's some people who are disappointed if you haven't noticed. The, uh... This is my cousin Sebastian in, in New Zealand, and I want to do something about value and what is valuable. Yeah, I mean, obviously materialistic stuff is valuable, I suppose. It has a monetary value, but real value is, an, in, uh, is in time, and uh, anticipation, that's got a value. Sometimes the anticipation of something is more valuable than the actual thing. And, and so I wanted to do something on that and also taking, again, making the most of what I've got. And, and one of the few free activities we've got um, is skimming stones. Skimming stones on a lake where they bounce on the lake. So I collected 20 skimming stones that I really thought would, would make a really good skimming stone. And I decided to turn them into luxury skimming stones. So I, gold, I 24 karat gold leafed each stone, and then I made these little leather pouches in the shape of each stone that you carry around on your belt, and you wait for the moment, so, and you wait. You wait. So I, you know, I, I wrote a little story, as I like making objects that tell stories, really. It's not really about the object, it's about the story they tell. I wrote a little story about a guy who'd carried around his luxury skimming stone for 25 years, three months, two weeks, one day, and suddenly he's in front of the perfect lake. It's like a mirror, and he knows that this is the moment. And so he, he takes out his luxury skimming stone from his belt pouch, and his hand's shaking, and he, and he, he pulls, pulls back his arm, and, and he's thinking, what, what if it plops, and what, what, you know, after all of this time? Uh, 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 and then I stop the story there. This is about listening, and I was thinking about how do I, uh, why am I the person I am, or why do I think like this, and it, it's my parents, really. And my dad is, uh, he's, a, he's, he's such, such an outgoing person, he'll talk to anybody in the street, you know, he, treat, he talks to people as though he's known them for years, it, which, which like throws people, and he's, he's sort of a tease. He loves teasing people. Uh, I went up north, and I was in the living room um, with me and my dad. He's got a company called Dip and Strip, right? It's not what you think. It's a it's a it's a <laughs> furniture paint stripping company. And someone rang his mobile phone and said, 
and asked for a price to strip a, a, door, a, a table. A table. And I, I was listening to him, and he said, um, how big's the table? What's the dimensions of the table? And the lady on the phone didn't really know. She, and he said, um, he said, how tall are you? And I'm thinking, what's he saying? Why is he, ask, why is he asking someone how tall he is? And she told him how tall he is. And he says, if you lie on the t- table top, do your legs dangle over the edge? <laughs> and the funny thing was, there was a pause, and then she'd said, yeah, me, me, well, my feet get a, a dangle over the edge. And he said, OK, 75 pound. LAUGHTER <coughs> uh, so that's my dad, and that's just that. So I grew up following my dad around all the time. That was like just a little example. My mother is the opposite. She's very, she's quiet and and um, thought, you know, very thoughtful, thinking of other people and um, observing things. And um, and I'm like a I'm like a cross breed between the two. So I've got my mum's quietness because I'm quite a quiet person, thoughtful. But I've got that um, that desire to sort of. Uh, push people off balance a little bit and provoke p- thoughts and uh, yeah um, so that's from my dad and anyway I secretly uh, recorded because when I when I was young every week my mum's sisters would come around my aunties come around to the house and have coffee mornings and, and laugh uh, you know um, biscuits and uh, I would sit in the room and I'd be shy and I'd listen for two hours to my mum's aunties my mum's sisters um, talking and laughing, and I'd just be listening all the time. And then when I thought I had something really, really funny or, or clever or interesting to say, I would say it, and everybody would be quiet, and they'd look at me, and they'd enjoy it, and then I'd be quiet again for another two hours. <laughs> and I just secretly recorded them. And I, I, because I actually think um, I'm doing that in my work, I'm putting everything I've got into a thing or a drawing, and I'm, I'm stepping away from it. I'm, put, you know, I'm trying to make as much out of something as I was then. And I just secretly recorded um, some of my aunties recently. It's just, I think that it's Auntie Maisie, Auntie Betty, Auntie Audrey. And Auntie Maisie has done some painting and they're taking the, they're taking the mickey out of her a little bit. Um, <laughs> 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 Anyway, that goes on for five hours, and um, <coughs> so that's what I come from. Anyway, unexpected perspective. Yeah, um, I've got this record. So I was asked to do a souvenir of East London. And, I, and in East London, there's not many grand buildings uh, like Big Ben or whatever you'd have in central London. But there's a lot of people who make stuff. And so I decided to record the sound of makers, uh, historical, skillful, interesting makers around London. So I took a sound recorder and I just recorded the sound. Um, yeah, this is a neon light maker. So I just, that's me with my hand device there. Um, this is the oldest, the oldest manufacturer in Britain. Um, <clears throat> that's them tuning a, tuning a, a bell. Uh, you scrape metal from the inside, they're spinning it round. They made, the, they made Big Ben's bell here, and the Liberty Bell, the original one. So, and, that, and then on the back, I've just wrote um, the, the sound, the, the, the making sounds. I, so like, this is, uh, this was where they made Harry Potter's spectacles, as a spectacle maker. That's a shoemaker. That's uh, a poet, John Hegley, John Hegley used as a typewriter. Um, and sound is undervalued. We, we, that's Terry de Havilland, who's a shoemaker. Um, sound is such an undervalued thing, I really like it. You know, it, it reveals an, an alternative uh, perspective, I guess, on, on, um, on making. This is a toothbrush maraca. <coughs> Because when, you, when you're making, you can make your own sounds. There's so much in history, so much craft, such, so much making has gone on, on over thousands of years. It seems a shame to, to ignore it and just be looking to the future. Um, so I've done a few projects where I have looked back and looked at uh, crafts people and looked at techniques of the past and things that have been made in the past. I love going around museums and, and trying to find something that I find interesting. It might not be the whole thing, but it might be some element. I made these future and past viewing binoculars, so you type in what year you want to view, and then you can see whatever year that is, very useful. This is a teacup 
cooling fan. So I don't like it when you get your hot tea, it burns your lips, you know. I don't like that. And, I, and I've taken the pattern, so basically I like the pattern, so I put that pattern onto the fan, to, and it's, it's as though they were meant to be like this, you know. Uh, bringing, tech, bringing the past together with the future and technology. I got commissioned to create a pair of shoes. So every project I do is different, you know, different subjects. And I'm coming with a fresh perspective. So, so this was shoemaking. Well, I'd never made a pair of shoes. And I didn't want to make just another pair of shoes. I thought, what is the, what is the, most, what's the best pair of shoes? And it's Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and her ruby red slippers. She clicks the heels together. She gets taken back to Kansas. I thought, given modern technology, could I do something similar? So I thought about that, and basically I made these GPS, these no place like home GPS shoes. I don't know whether you can see, it's a bit dark, but... So basically what happens is you plot on a map where you want to go in the world. You press upload to shoe. So the shoe knows where you want to go. In the shoe there's, a, there's some GPS embedded in the heel. You then click the heels together, there's a little magnet switch in the back, which starts the GPS. So the GPS knows where you are and where you want to go. Then this right... Uh, left shoe, there's a little row of um, LEDs, uh, which are in the perforations of the brogue shoe. So I was trying to, f trying to be as subtle as possible, trying to make some shoes that I'd want to wear, because I think my, you know, wearable technology is a big thing. But I think the test of wearable technology is if the technology broke, would you still want to wear the, the, the object? I think that's a good test. That most fail, I think. So anyway, I'm using a traditional crafts maker with technology, and the, and the right shoe is a progress bar. So as you get closer, it grows. I did my little drawings of a little guy walking through the city to get, get home. That's connected with the computer. There's a little, this is outside, this is in Hackney, uh, walking to, to an exhibition. That was me and it going to an exhibition there, thank you. The creative eye. Being creative is, is a proactive thing. So I remind myself constantly to switch on a creative eye so I'm always on the lookout when I'm talking to someone or I'm in the pub or I'm in the restaurant or I'm on the bus. I'm always on the lookout for ideas. A year ago, I was in Durham Cathedral, which is in the northeast with my family, and I looked at the stained glass windows and I thought, wow, they're amazing. They're amazing things, but we don't see that in contemporary design. And would it, be in, it would be really interesting to do something in three dimensions. So that was in the back of my mind, and then I moved on. Then I got this brief challenge from Dezine and Mini to create your vision for the future of mobility. And so I thought about driverless cars, which seemed to me to be an inevitable future thing. <laughs> eventually, eventually. So I've, I've proposed, I, I looked to the year 2059, I picked a year just to focus on, and 2059 was, is actually 100 years after the first Mini, the, the little, remember that little Mini uh, came out in 1959. So I, I'm saying in 2059, statistics will show that it is safer to ride in an automated driverless vehicle than ride in a human control vehicle. And so there's be super safe. This will free up car designers to create a living space on wheels. And so I pushed this to the limit of, of the idea by making a, wanting to make a stained glass driverless sleeper car. So you just go to, so these were the sketches I did. And when I get do the sketches, I get excited about it. You know, and, and I, I love that feeling of exhilaration. It it's, it's like that. It is that feeling. That's Gene Wilder. I love Gene Wilder. And so I worked with Middlesex University a product design team, and they, they helped on the, um, this was CNC cut, and those are original mini wheels. My, that was my little reference to the original mini. That, I took that frame to the stained glass workshop, and I took a five-day workshop course in how to do stained glass making, and then continued. That was soldering. Soldering on a vertical is really difficult. The solder just runs down. Making decisions on the, on the colours. There's eight different colours, including clear. I decided to do triangles for every rectangle on the, on the frame. That was just like you blue tack them in. I used a copper foil technique, which is the thing that you use to do uh, 
Tiffany lamps, if you know those old-fashioned lamps. Again, it was like making it up as we went along. I uh, didn't know how, what it was going to look like, really. One fell off, I went to hospital, I've got a mark here, that's my tattoo of the stained glass car. Yeah, making it up as I go along, making decisions. That was the final car. I did a ZZZ number plate, people keep saying, why do you do ZZZ? I'm not telling you, that's ridiculous. It's obviously, because I'm asleep. Uh, that's me asleep. <laughs> that's me travelling back to my studio after a hard day's work, asleep. That's me back in my studio. Anyway, thank you very much for listening.